Okay, we've got a series going on in the life of David, and I want you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel today, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll be reading verses 42 through 49. The title of my message this morning is David Defeated a Foolish Philistine. David Defeated a Foolish Philistine. 1 Samuel 17 verse 42 says this, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you to, into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would simply enable me to share this message as it's been prepared, that I would simply be an amplifier of the text, revealing what your word says. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Most people are familiar with the story about David defeating Goliath. Even those who don't know the Bible very well have heard about it. Uh, for example, if an unranked football team from a weaker conference takes on a top 10 team from a strong, stronger conference and somehow pulls off the upset, we compare that to David defeating Goliath. Or if some average man in the community takes on City Hall and wins his case, we compare that to David defeating Goliath. But there's really a lot more to this story than just the fact that a little man defeated a big man. It's a story about two worldviews colliding and the fact that a man by the name of the Goliath made the foolish, foolish mistake of mocking the living God. Goliath was way in over his head and he was way too foolish to recognize that. But you see, Goliath foolishly mocked Jehovah, the true and living God, Jehovah Sabaoth to be exact, which means the Lord of armies Amen. and God never loses a battle. Amen. Amen. Belshazzar, who was a co-regent from the kingdom of Babylon, mocked God. And do you remember how that went down? Belshazzar asked some men to bring to him some vessels that had been taken from the temple of God, golden vessels that were intended, intended for the worship of Jehovah God. He had those vessels filled with wine, and then he encouraged his nobles to participate with him in a sacrilegious act. In Daniel 5, verse 4, the Bible says they drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And immediately after this, Belshazzar and his nobles saw a hand, just a hand, writing on the wall. And the hand wrote the words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. Eventually, Daniel was summoned and he gave the king an interpretation. He said that meant numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. And that's exactly what happened. The kingdom of Babylon was divided between the Medes and the Persians, and Belshazzar was executed that same night. And here's something else that Daniel said to Belshazzar. He said, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, wood, and stone, which you do not see, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and all your ways you have not glorified. The last part of that verse reveals the height of Belshazzar's folly. Look at it again. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Listen to me. Are you listening? All that God has to do to take a person's life is to stop giving that person his life. And that's why it's extremely foolish to mock the living God. Amen. Belshazzar learned that the hard way and Goliath learned that the hard way. Goliath, Goliath was a giant of a man, he was no match, but he was no match for the living God. And that's why David knew that he would be able to defeat Goliath. In verse 45, he said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. So there it is, big mistake. 
All the rest of the Israelites saw a giant named Goliath, and they said to themselves, Oh my, in comparison to me, he is so big. But when David saw the giant Goliath, he said to himself, Oh my, in comparison to God, he's so small. Amen. Goliath had been mocking God for 40 days, and so David knew that Goliath was a doomed man, and that's why he volunteered to take him out. That's what this passage is all about. So with that in mind, I've divided it into three parts. The first thing I want you to see is what I'm going to call the presence of a vicious soldier. The presence of a vicious soldier. And I want you to see that Goliath was intimidating. Notice, first of all, his appearance. We're told in verse 4 that Goliath's height was six cubits and a span. That means that Goliath was over nine feet tall. Nine feet, nine inches is, is a conservative estimate. The tallest man in the world today is a Kurdish farmer who lives in Turkey named Sultan Kosin. He's eight feet, two inches tall, but Goliath was over a foot taller. And all we have to do is add a beard to this guy and a snarl, and it's even easy to see how he could immediately make it as a lineman for any team in the NFL. The point is this guy was huge. By the way, which man, which man in Israel should have been the one to take up the challenge? It should have been King Saul. We're told in 1 Samuel 9 verse 2 that from his shoulders and up, Saul was taller than any of the people. So apparently Saul tried to hide his own cowardice by offering some lucrative incentives to anyone who would be, would be willing to face this and defeat this giant. Look at verse 25. Back in verse 25, he said, uh, Saul said this. He said, uh, he said, the man of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his house, his father's house free in Israel. So Saul offered three lucrative incentives, great wealth, freedom from taxes for this man and his family. That sounds pretty good. And to make him a part of the royal family. But even that was not enough to cause any of the Israelite soldiers to take on Goliath. Instead, they just drew back and trembled every time he came up and started mocking God and challenging them. So that's his appearance. But now notice his accoutrements. We're told in verse 5 that Goliath had a bronze helmet and they had scale armor that weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. That would be about 200 pounds or more. Now, I know what it's like to try to carry an 80-pound sack of cement around. This guy carried 200 pounds on his body, so he had to be strong. He also had a bronze javelin. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and it weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's about 25 pounds. Now, think about this. A shot put uh, is 16 pounds, so the, the head of his spear weighed 25 pounds. Without a doubt, the bronze armor shining in the sun was intended to enhance his ability to intimidate and demoralize the Israelite soldiers. I like what Charles, Dr. Charles Swindoll described this. He said, Goliath was kind of like the cross-eyed javelin thrower. He didn't score any points for his team, but he kept the crowd alert. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a pretty good description. Now, this is, listen, this description of Goliath's armor and his weapons are here for a reason. Because it highlights the fact that the, the Philistines were technologically advanced, far, far advanced than the Israelites were. At this time, the Philistines were the only ones who knew how to smelt iron, and that was a very well-guarded secret. In fact, they guarded this secret so well that there was not a single blacksmith in all of Israel. This also meant that the Philistines were the only people in the area who had swords and spears and even chariots. In fact, there was a time when the Israelites fought the Philistines and there were only two swords among them, one for King Saul and one for his son, Jonathan. Of course, this is why the Israelites often hid up in the mountains because all the Israelites had were clubs and stones. And so if they got out in the open, the Philistines would clearly have the advantage. So that's his accoutrements, but now notice his arrogance. Twice a day for 40 days in a row, Goliath came out to taunt the army of Israel and to defy their God. Now I want you to notice something in verse 25. I want you to notice those two words coming up. Now those are significant because in verse 8 we're simply told that Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel. Now apparently he had become so bold that he was literally coming up on the other side. <laughs> Listen, think about it. This is what happens when you don't deal with a giant early on. 
That giant in your life, whether it's a giant person, an intimidating person, or a giant problem like an addiction or whatever it is, is not going to go away until you face it. Amen. And if you don't face it early on, it's going to get worse and more and more intimidating. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. The giants that all of us have to face in life are not just going to go away. We're going to have to be willing to confront them. Now, does this story remind you of any other story that you find in the Bible? It reminds me of the fact that history has a way of repeating itself. You see, the Bible says that when the Israelites came to the promised land, they refused to go in and occupy it. And do you remember why? The reason was because they didn't go in and occupy the land was because they were afraid of the giants. Ten of those twelve men who went to spy out the land of Canaan caused the rest of the Israelites to cower in fear. When they said, we saw the descendants of Anak there. That word Anak means giants. We saw giants there. And then they used a metaphor and said, we became like grasshoppers in their sight. Now this was, you have to think about it. This was after they had seen numerous miracles. They had seen the pillar of fire by night. They would seen the cloud by day. They would seen water come out of a rock. They would seen manna from heaven. Yet nevertheless, they were afraid of those giants. So they said, well, here we go again. Only this time, it's not giants, plural, that are intimidating them. It's just one giant. You would have thought they'd have learned by now. Amen. Goliath was intimidating, and I want you to know that David was infuriated. What set David apart from all the other Israelites was the fact that David really was a man after God's own heart. And when David heard Goliath blaspheming the name of his God, this really bothered him. In fact, it made him furious. It caused him to say a couple of things about Goliath that are very revealing. First, he said that Goliath was uncircumcised. That simply means that David recognized the fact that Goliath was not a recipient of God's covenant. He was not part of God's chosen people. Second, he said that Goliath was ungodly. Several times, David refers to our God as the living God. And he does that to point out that there's a great contrast between our God, singular, and and their gods, plural. One of their gods was Dagon. Dagon was a fish god. We're told in 1 Samuel 5, 4 that when the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the temple of Dagon, that Dagon fell down head first. Because Dagon was a fish god. He had the head of a fish and he had the body of a man. The Bible says his hands and feet came off. It literally says only the Dagon was left. That means that only the fish part was left as it fell and broke apart in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. Another of their gods was very interesting because it was Beelzebub. And the word Baal means God, and the word Zebub literally means fly. So this means that Goliath and the Philistines worshipped a fly, a common house fly. This tells us something about what they believed about how life originated. In fact, listen to this. They basically believed in an ancient form of evolution. Because one day they looked down, I guess, at a cow patty or something, and they saw these little creatures moving around, these dung beetles that eventually come, become flies. And they thought in their mind that must be where life comes from. It all started out, you know, does it sound familiar? Like, kind of like Carl Sagan's Cosmic Soup, you know, where, uh, where that's where life really began. Just kind of, it's just a little more of a grotesque form. And listen, this bothered David. In fact, this infuriated David that he was being mocked by a God who believes in dung beetles. Now, the good reason for believing that David's reaction was similar to Jesus' reaction when he threw the money changers out of the temple in John chapter 2. Jesus became angry. Did you know that Jesus could become um, angry? He became so angry that he turned over the table of the money changers and he drove the animals out with a whip. And he said, my, my father's house shall be a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise. We're told in John 2, 16 that this fulfilled a prophecy about the Messiah that's found in Psalm 69, verse 9, which says, For the zeal of your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The reason I feel that David's reaction was similar to Jesus' reaction to the money changers at the temple is because David is the one who wrote Psalm 69, verse 9. The point is, if you, think, if you think that all this story is about is David and Goliath, it's about a little man whipping up on a big man, then you've missed the point completely. This is about two worldviews colliding. This is about a foolish Philistine who mocked the living God and about a man named David who was deeply concerned about the glory of God. 
This is what gave David the courage he needed to take on Goliath. His courage came out of his convictions. Think about that. When we have a cause that's bigger than ourselves and our desires, that can cause us to be courageous. I thought about Deborah's courage. You remember Deborah in the Old Testament, like David's courage? Her courage came out of her convictions. Her courage came out of her convictions about a cause. You see, the Bible says that Deborah noticed that the streets weren't safe to travel anymore. And I absolutely love that phrase. It says, until I arose a mother in Israel. This was one mother in Israel. And I'll tell you what happened. Mama got fed up with Sisera and his thugs, and she decided to do something about it. David, in a similar way, was zealous about a cause that was bigger than himself, namely the honor and glory of God. And I believe David essentially said, it really doesn't matter whether I live or die. All that really matters is that someone will take a stand for the glory of God. So we see the presence of a vicious soldier, but then we see the presentation of a victorious strategy. Now notice David's perspective. As I stated in my introduction, David simply looked at Goliath differently from everyone else. All those other Israelites took one look at Goliath and they said, he's too big to hit. And David took a look at Goliath and said, he's too big to miss. <laughs> Listen, before any of us can become giant killers, I believe we'll have to come to the point of looking at our giants in this way. In other words, who your giant is or what your giant is really doesn't matter that much. Because the Bible says that God is still greater than bigger than your giants. Yeah. In Jeremiah 32, 27, the prophet spoke for God and said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Of course, the implied answer to that rhetorical question is no. And David had some past victories under his belt that reminded him of this. Look at verse 34 now through 36. For David said to Saul, your servant has, was, was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. This was one reason why the Israelites refused to go in and occupy the land of promise, wasn't it? They had forgotten, right? They had forgotten about the miracles that God had done for them. They had forgotten about the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. They had forgotten about their victory over the Amalekites. They had forgotten all about how God had delivered them in the past. The difference is David remembered how God had delivered him from the past, and he knew that God would give him future victories as well. In fact, I think this is why David took Goliath's sword and Goliath's skull back to his tent so that he would have some more reminders of the victories that God had given him in the past. We see David's perspective, but now I want you to notice David's persistence. When we get ready to take on a giant, we can expect to face some common obstacles. David faced them, and we'll most likely have to face them as well. First, David faced the dismay of others. In verse 11 and again in verse 24, we're told that when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Fear is contagious. And therefore, when we go into battle to face the giants, we can expect find, to find those around us who are cowardly and weak need and who say it can't be done. And then David faced the disdain of others. In verse 28, we discover that David's oldest brother, Eliab, burned with anger, and the Bible says that he scorned David. Listen to what he said to him there in verse, uh, verse 28 through verse 30. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I think he was putting a little, a little jab in there. I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? I think that's a great response. Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered and said the same thing as before. Now, uh, I believe Eliab uh, did this because he was jealous of David. Remember, Eliab was there when the prophet Samuel anointed David at, as a young boy. One of the strange things about taking on giants is that sometimes opposition emerges from among our own so-called allies. 
fact, that even happened to Jesus during his earthly ministry. In John 7, verses 3 through 5, we're told that Jesus' brothers came to him and said this, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers were not believing in him. You see, even Jesus' brothers, even Jesus was encountered with the jealousy and scorn of his brothers. Why don't you go public this with why if, if you're such a big shot, why don't you go down there, there into, into Jerusalem and start showing people who you are? So what did David do about all of this scorn and disdain? The answer is nothing, nothing. And that was wise. David was wise enough to know that the real enemy was not within the ranks of Israel. It was that giant standing in the valley of Elah. Amen. David faced the disdain of others, and then David faced the discouragement of others. When David came to King Saul and volunteered for the assignment, King Saul was not exactly convinced that David could pull it off. He said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for your buddy youth, while he's been a warrior from his youth. Now, there's nothing better than a big vote of confidence just before the big game, right? The same thing happened to Joshua and Caleb when they tried to convince the people to take on the giants of the land of Canaan. The other ten men discouraged the people by saying, we're not able to go up against the people for they're too strong for us. And then David faced the distraction of others. After David told Saul about how he killed the bear and the lion, Saul decided to act pious. He said, the Lord be with you. Then Saul tried to be helpful by putting his armor on David. Now, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, just you need to just stop and think what this must have been like because, uh, because Saul was the tallest man in Israel. Uh, you know, that would be like me trying to put on Jeff's armor, all right? You know, somebody five foot six putting on the armor, somebody that's six foot eight or something like that. David realized quickly that this wasn't going to work. David realized that the potential uh, of, was the, had the potential of robbing him of his strengths. You see, David's advantage was that he was small and quick, and Goliath's disadvantage was that he was big and slow. And by the way, we're told in Judges 20, verse 16, that there were some in Israel who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. I think that was David. I bet as he was out there watching those sheep, he did a little practicing. I bet he was pretty good with that sling. Now, the point is this, if we, if we all have to be very careful about trying to become someone that we're not. We need to learn what our strengths are. We need to emphasize our strengths. We see David's persistence. But then we see David's power. I want you to notice that David's motive was the glory of the Lord. He took Goliath on in the name of the Lord. We looked at those verses. Look, let's look at them again in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now this was the key to David's victory. It's very important for us to understand this because our giants are real. Those giants that the Israelites refused to face in Numbers 13 and eventually did face in Joshua chapter 3 were real. In fact, Goliath was a type or symbol of Satan in the Old Testament. And I hope you know that none of us can take Satan on in our own strength. That's why before Paul told us about the armor of God in Ephesians 6, he said, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might. This is why the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me in Philippians 4.13. Of course, we all know what happened next. David put a, a stone in that sling. He had five of them. I think that might be because, because they tell me that, uh, that the giant had four brothers. So he said, if you want, I'll take all five of them on. I don't know, but he slung that Swung that sling around, he let it go, and uh, nothing like that had ever entered Goliath's mind before, all right? But, uh, and you know, he fell face down on the ground, and then David rushed over and cut off the giant's head. A guy named Dr. Robert Greenbelt laid all this down. 
He said that the reason David was able to defeat Goliath was because Goliath suffered from tunnel vision. And that uh, he could only see right in front of him. And so I guess David could jump around. I think, well, that's a stretch. Dr. Stuart Briscoe, on the other hand, pointed out that in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, it says that the stone went through Goliath's helmet. Now, would you like to know what I think about all that? I'm surprised the stone didn't take his head off. Can I get a witness to that? Because yeah, yeah. that stone had behind it the power of God. And why did God choose to use some young, scrawny teenage boy who had never even started to shave yet to defeat this giant? The answer is so that, the, so that his own glory could be put on yeah. display. As I pointed out, out last week, any of us is qualified to be a number one draft pick. You know that? It doesn't matter how, what size you are, how big you are, how smart you are. If you're serving the living God and doing his purposes, you can be victorious. So we see the presentation of the victorious strategy. But finally, and very importantly, I want you to see the picture of a vicarious savior. Now, this is the most, most famous battle described in the Old Testament, and I can make that claim for two reasons. First, I can make that claim for a scriptural reason. You see, this is one of the longest chapters in the Bible. This chapter is 58 verses long, and it describes this battle in great detail. Secondly, I can make this claim for a symbolic reason. But you see, there's so much symbolism in this story that it's really impossible to, to miss it. Goliath, as I said earlier, is a symbol of Satan. In fact, he's even identified with a threefold repetition of the number six. We all know about that number 666. Goliath walked around like a roaring lion, and Peter tells us that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour Goliath blasphemed God and he insulted the Israelites for 40 days. And the number 40 in the Bible is a number of testing and trial. The Israelites, for example, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before the devil came to tempt him. Goliath's name literally means one who strips or one who steals. And that's what Satan does. Jesus was talking about Satan in John 10, verse 10, when he said the thief, that is Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I would just underline that word only because that's all that he comes to do. Goliath is a symbol of Satan. David is a symbol of Jesus. This is the most famous battle in the Old Testament, yet it's a battle between just two people because this was a vicarious battle. I want you to notice that David got some spoils, not just for himself, but for the rest of the Israelites as well. Look at verse 53. It says in verse 53, the sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Likewise, in Ephesians 4, 8, we read when he, that is Jesus, ascended on a high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Their gifts were literal spoils from the battle, but our gifts are spiritual gifts, and some of those are listed in Ephesians chapter 4. In closing, I want you to see some very interesting parallels between David and Jesus that we find in this passage. First of all, David was sent by his father. We, By the way, we can pretty much assume David was under 20 years of age because that's how old you had to be to fight and go into battle. So his three older brothers met that criteria. They were over 20. G uh, uh, David was probably just about 13 years old. And so he was sent by his father to the battle to check up on his brothers and bring them some food. And in John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then David brought bread from his father. I like to say grilled cheese sandwiches because he brought some wheat and he brought some cheese and you fry that up, you got a grilled cheese sandwich. Well, anyway, in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to, he who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. So David was sent by his father. David brought bread from his father. And then David came to his own and they rejected him. In John 1, 11 and 12, the Bible says, He, that is Jesus, came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive them. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So David was sent by his father. David brought bread from his father. David came to his own and was rejected by them. And then David went down into the valley of death as a representative. 
In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and here it is, to give his life a ransom for many. The Lord Jesus was our representative. He went into the valley of death to face Satan for us. And then finally, David won a decisive victory. And we know our Lord Jesus won a decisive victory as well. Amen. In Colossians 2.15, the Apostle Paul said, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, I want you to know, if you know Greek, that's one of the most, most there's, there's a lot of vivid imagery in that one scripture verse right there. Because what it was describing was the defeat of a king. In those days, when you defeated a king from another army, one thing you would do is you would cut off their thumbs. That's what it means when it says he was disarmed. And the reason they would cut off the thumb of that king was because that meant he could no longer hold a sword. It meant he was no longer a threat to the people anymore. And then they would take that king and they would make a public spectacle of him. They would strip him naked. They would tie him to the back of a chariot. And they would take that chariot through town and drag that man through the street uh, naked to show his shame and embarrassment and would make a public spectacle out of him. You thought that came right out in the old westerns. Well, they did it long before then. They did it back then. What that verse is saying is when Jesus died on the cross and then rose again, he defeated the Satan. He disarmed him. He took away the death and the fear of death, which yeah. Satan could give to all people. But not only that, he put him to shame. He embarrassed him. He defeated him. He made a public spectacle of him when he rose from the grave victorious. Isn't that great? Amen. That's what the Lord Jesus did for us. And why did Jesus come to the cross? And why did he come down? And why did he die on the cross for us and rise again on the third day? So that he could offer us the wonderful hope of eternal life by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah. How is someone saved? How will someone gain a relationship with God and eternal life? We gain that simply by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. We recognize that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We recognize that we cannot earn our way into heaven by good works. If we could do that, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. But he died on the cross and rose again on the third day. And the Bible says that if you'll place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, that you will never perish but have eternal life.